Welcome to this presentation, where I will try to summarize the relevance of genetics in psychiatry, focusing on the present situation and the possible future perspectives. But before talking about the present and the future, just one slide about the past. In the past uh, 50 years, a lot of research has been done in genetics, and the results are summarized here. The answer is very simple. Genetic factors are indeed very important in all psychiatric disorders. This is an example for major psychosis, and it's quite clear from family studies that if you consider the prevalence in the population of about 1% of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, for example, if you have some kind of relationships with the patient, like the brothers, like the parents, and so on, you see that the rate of disease is much higher. And it is even more if uh, you consider brother or twins of uh, affected subjects. In specific, identical twins have a rate of affection of about 50% or even more for some other disorders. So, considering these observations that has been done for many years now, it is quite clear that sharing the same genetic code of an affected subject increases a lot the risk of being affected. Of course, the risk is not 100%, as it would be expected if the disorder is 100% genetic. So, we can conclude from these 50 years of the past that genetic factors are indeed very important and explain a part of the risk of the disease. So, we can conclude from the 50 or more years of research so far that psychiatric disorders are indeed highly heritable. And so, let's focus now in which is the present situation what we know at present about the genetics of uh, psychiatric disorders. Well, we learned from the past that genetic factors are indeed important. But of course, the challenge is to understand exactly which genetic factors are important, which are the genes. Because with family studies, we can make some kind of, uh, let's say, advice to the patients or to the subjects. If you have an affected sibling or an affected father or mother, you have a higher risk of developing a disorder. But this is a general suggestion. We need to know which are the specific factors so that we can make a specific prediction for each subject. And this is the, presence, the present status. These are the most important studies that have been so far performed in the genetic field. As you see, they have been all published in very good journals. The first one is related to bipolar disorder, and the second is uh, related very recent uh, on depression, and the third is the famous one on schizophrenia. What you can understand from all these very exciting studies that have been performed so far <coughs> is that indeed a number of genes have been identified and has been confirmed for the first time in the history of psychiatric genetics uh, has conferring risk for bipolar disorder, depression, or schizophrenia. As you can see from the title of these papers, the number is quite relevant. 100 uh, uh, genes are uh, somehow important for depression, uh, 108 for uh, schizophrenia, and a little bit less for uh, bipolar disorder. But consider that studies are ongoing, and for example, in the uh, not yet published papers that I'm working on, the numbers are higher in the range of two or three hundred uh, possible uh, um, risk genes. So you understand from this point uh, that uh, the number of genes that give risk of developing bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, or depression is a high number. And so when we were thinking 20 or 30 years ago that a single gene could be the risk factor for psychiatric disorder, this is not the reality now. So, without going into the detail, these are the most important and large studies made on over 1 million subjects uh, that have been performed so far. <clears throat> Results are there, but the question is, are they clinically relevant? 
Well, if you consider the risk of having a high burden of all these variants, high burden means uh, a lot of these risk genes in, uh, in, in your genome, while the odds ratio is in the range of two, three, or even four. So the answer is yes and no. If you have a high uh, risk score, that means many gene variants that give risk for schizophrenia, you have a, indeed a higher risk to develop schizophrenia. But this applies only to 10% of the population. The majority of subjects have an intermediate risk. So the clinical uh, um, interpretation is not uh, ready yet. Moreover, things are even more complicated if you consider this our very recent study that the, the overlap in terms of risk uh, is quite high. If you see, for example, here, the number is 0.72. It means that the genes that give the risk for schizophrenia are very similar to the genes that give risk for bipolar disorder. And uh, similar also the correlation between uh, major depression and ADHD. While, for example, uh, autism has no much correlation with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So this is another complicating factor. Because we have seen that the scores, scores means the combination of genes that are at risk for a specific disorder are relevant, but it can be applied to a range of disorders. And in fact, in these other very large studies, <coughs> it is quite clear that what is called the polygenic risk score, polygenic risk score means the combination of risk coming from the genes that I showed you in the previous slides, indeed changes uh, what you see in clinical picture. For example, if you have an increasing schizophrenia score, an increasing schizophrenia risk, therefore, you have uh, uh, subjects with bipolar disorder that have a higher rate of psychotic symptoms. So it means that the genetic risk of schizophrenia modifies the clinical appearance of bipolar subjects. I summarize here that specific genes have at the end been detected, but still we cannot directly apply in clinical practice. But if the risk for developing a psychiatric disorder is not still possible to be used in clinical practice, maybe you have seen in the general press, like in this paper, that the genetic of response to treatment is already available at present. This is the case of a woman who, after a genetic testing, found the right treatment for her depression. And indeed, if you consider the label of psychiatric drugs, it is second only to oncology in terms of drugs with genetic information in the label. That is 37. It is a lot. So let's see in a couple of slides uh, how this could be useful in clinical practice. So at present, uh, we can use genetic for uh, guiding treatment to uh, prescription. And uh, uh, this can be done in a specific subgroup of patients. For example, when you have a subject who is non-responding or uh, not tolerating specific drug. In this case, it could be useful to make genotyping of the metabolizing enzymes, CYP, and then we can have uh, possible results. We can have the usual, that is called extensive metabolizer, and then we use the clinical criteria to guide drug treatment. <laughs> or we can have the ultra rapid metabolizer. So therefore, it means that those patients uh, are activately, are uh, very activated in terms of uh, liver enzymes. And therefore, we have to use much higher doses of, uh, uh, of the standard sometimes even double the dose. In other cases, we have subjects that are called poor metabolizers. In this case, the plasma level can be too high, and then we have to reduce the starting dose, sometimes even at half. And this is already available in the market. Uh, these numbers are probably by now old, because uh, we have more than 40 or 50 companies worldwide that are selling uh, uh, pharmacogenetic test to use in clinical practice. Those tests include the CYP, but the problem is that those tests usually include also other genes that are not so strongly 
demonstrated to be clinically relevant. And this is why uh, man, many reports, many papers are discussing the issue that uh, in the race of using genetic tests to predict uh, antidepressant or antipsychotic treatment, uh, science must be left behind. Because science is not ready yet to have an extensive use of genetics, also in antidepressant and antipsychotic uh, prediction. And uh, the problem is this, these tests are quite, quite, quite common. Probably in, in all countries now, there are a lot of companies that are advertising this possibility to clinicians. But uh, the doubt is that, is this ready for uh, clinical use in the store that we have? First, the problem is that the pharmacogenetic tests that are sold in the internet uh, uh, are being object of debate also based on uh, um, scientific uh, uh, institutions and societies. This because these tests usually include uh, variants uh, in genes that are not supported by evidence in a very strong way. You can see some detail of this in our recently published paper. So pharmacogenetic can be useful in specific cases. So I tell very clearly that it is useful when we want to see the metabolizing enzymes. Therefore, if a patient is a ultra-rapid metabolizer or a poor metabolizer, this is a very useful indication for increasing the dose or decreasing the dose. Probably the other genes that are indicating the choice of the specific compound are still not exactly uh, available now. A couple of slides about the future. The future, as you have understood now, is probably linked to what is so-called the polygenic risk scores, a combination of uh, uh, scores that come from all the genes that have you in your genome, all of us in the genome, that give risk towards some specific direction. This uh, very recent paper showed very clearly that it is possible to create a polygenic risk score, in this case coming from whole exome sequencing, and this score is composed, as you can imagine, by many, many genes that regulate the cell growth and survival, the neuroplasticity and neurodegeneration, signal transduction, hormones, immune system. And with this uh, um, combination of scores, uh, we can indeed predict um, quite well all subjects that can respond or not respond to specific uh, um, treatments by combining genetic and clinical factors. In this other paper, you can see detail of this, of this, of this process, uh, where you can see uh, that every subject can have a different score on pathway. This could be an inflammatory pathway, this could be a neurodegeneration pathway, that should be combined with the clinical scores. That could be risk factors, social support, and so on, to have a total score. And finally, another possible application of the scores is in this other uh, of our recent papers, uh, where uh, polygenic risk scores give indication in specific uh, which uh, treatment we could prescribe or not. And in this paper, we show that, for example, if a bipolar patient has a very high polygenic risk score for schizophrenia, it is better to prescribe second generation antipsychotics, atypical antipsychotics, rather than lithium, for example, because the genetic background is a little bit different. And so, going to the end, uh, uh, probably the future is uh, what is so called uh, one person trials. It means that every person is different from the other, both in terms of clinical factors and in terms of genetic factors. And the combination could be quite difficult and difficult to understand and difficult to apply in clinical practice. But uh, uh, with the big studies like this one, uh, all of us in the in US, including one million person, I think we will be able to have a, detail, a detailed uh, um, knowledge of all the genetic and clinical factors to guide the treatment and to understand and to make prediction. And so we have seen that psychiatric disorders are indeed highly heritable. We have seen that specific genes, uh, lastly, now in these last five, six years, have been identified. But still, there is no direct clinical application. On the other hand, in terms of pharmacogenetics, uh, um, there are available kits in the market. 
but their use is restricted to specific cases of poor metabolizer or a rapid metabolizer. For the future, a combination of genetic and clinical risk scores will for sure help diagnosis and treatment. In any case, genetics will sh we should not, never replace clinical judgment, but this is just another help that we can have to treat our patient. Thank you for your attention.